when we think of like who your favorite superhero is, I promise you, whoever you think your favorite superhero is, that is not an accurate representation of the character. Welcome to Profoundly Pointless. In this episode, we're going to look at superheroes, the hidden impact they have on society, and what some heroes really stand for. Our guest is superhero researcher Professor Gabriel Cruz. Thank you for joining us. Like and subscribe if you get a chance. So what is it about superheroes? What is it about it that speaks to us? That's a good question, and um, it's not an easy answer. The, the, the easy surface level answer is like, well, it's a way of playing with the fantastic, right? But it's a bit more to it than that. Um, superheroes have been, are a continuation in some sense of the ways in which we tell stories, dealing with the fantastic, whether that's having to do with the uh, divine and whatever conceptualization that is from a Abrahamic perspective or a uh, perhaps Buddhist or, or Hindu or Greek mythology or any of those sort of things. We always like the sort of beyond the human kind of stuff, right? But it's also about dealing with aspects of our own selves in many ways. I like to say that superheroes are uh, modern iterations of the future that have that are grappling with the past. And that is a way of sort of chewing on what's going on in the world, dealing with our anxieties and our fears, and hopefully having some degree of optimism, um, at least in modern superheroes. I say modern being like, you know, the last several decades. Is it always a deeper metaphor for something or is sometimes like, hey, man, it's just the Hulk's just the Hulk? It is what you get out of it. Um, it's always one of those things where people are like, oh, it's not that deep. I, it's not if you don't want it to be. Um, but like uh, a colleague of mine, a friend and colleague of mine, um, Dr. Julian Chambliss up at Michigan State University, who is a, uh, a historian who studies comics as historical artifacts, points out like they are moments in time, right? They are bound up by things. And so, yeah, some of them are just the Hulk smashing through Brooklyn and things like that as he does a Godzilla style fight with another creature. Right. And sometimes it's, you know, the 1974 uh, comic arc of Secret Empire with Captain America, where President where uh, President Richard Nixon kills himself. Right. Like some things don't get to just be surface level, but there's always more if you want there to be. But is this one of those things where the author writes it with those intentions or we kind of create those intentions afterwards? Well, it depends on who you ask, which I wish it's almost like asking the lawyers. Like the answer is always it depends. No, So like in my field, we don't care about the author. The author is nice. The author created the work. Right. But we engage in what's often referred to as the death of the author, where the intention doesn't matter. It's about how it lands. Right. So, for example, um, in game. Right. Uh, you have that scene where the, the, the uh, heroes of Earth are fighting Thanos and his invading army. And you have um, Captain America, you know, with the broken shield wielding Mjolnir. Right. Because he is worthy. Because if anyone's worthy, it's a white dude from the 1940s. Right. Uh, <laughs> and don't get me wrong. I love Cap, but it is what it is. Um, and he's wielding Mjolnir, Thor's hammer against an, a wave of non-white monstrous bodies. Right. Which is a time tested trope going back to like the cowboy and Indians, uh, Western genre or any of these sort of like imperialist colonialist propaganda that was put out in like the 18th and 19th centuries of these lone white European heroes fighting these faceless hordes of, again, non white bodies. Um, was it intended that way? No. And in the moment, I was totally engrossed and was like, man, this is super cool. And then there's a part of my brain that's going, man, the Nazis are going to love this. Right. And so like, that's, that's a part of the complexity. Did that, is that what the Russo brothers meant? I'm very sure they did not, but it matters how it lands, not what the author intended. But like, for me, I would not think that, right? Like I wouldn't think that, but at the same time, I'm a white guy from Kansas, you know? So does that, is there any kind of reading into something where maybe there isn't something really there? Or is it the other way? It's like, no, something's there. You're just not noticing it. The problem is whether or not something is there is a matter of the construct of like your own brain and disposition. So, for example, um, did you ever watch the, the Watchmen movie? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So whether you watch the movie or this is also the case with like the comic book to some extent, um, they're in, not counting the series on HBO that came out a little while ago. There was this this thing where like young men thought that Rorschach was a hero, right? 
where the so Rorschach, who's wearing the face mask with the with the Rorschach test that's floating onto the inkbots, whatever, like where he comes across as sympathetic or a hero. And this happens all the time with heroes or anti-heroes that are meant to be satirical or meant to point out that this is not positive, that there's some real negative things here. And so they find some degree of emotional resonance in a case like Rorschach. It's because uh, the the backstory of poverty and suffering and also like a moral absolutism that is very comforting to particularly folks who are growing up, you know, having to deal with the complexity of complexities of society. Like, yeah, that finds a degree of resonance. So when we say like, well, I wouldn't see that. That's totally fair. That's a reasonable interpretation. At the same time, all of these texts are what we call polysemic, which means that they're open to multiple uh, interpretations that may at times be um, contradictory, right? And that's the weirdness of media. And that's part of the, the beauty and also the, I won't say tragedy, but like the unfortunate side of superhero comics because they get to be reiterated over and over and over again. And when we think of like who your favorite superhero is, I promise you, whoever you think your favorite superhero is, that is not an accurate representation of the character, especially if they've been around for more than a decade, because there's been so many different versions of them, right? Newer ones, obviously, if there's only a few issues to go off of, then you get a much uh, smaller data size to extrapolate your own image of them from. But like, I don't know, a Wonder Woman, right? or a Batman or a Robin, whichever Robin you're talking about, all of which have had like, most of them have had, you know, multi-decade uh, publication histories. The version you have in your brain is picking and choosing based off of what you've read, what you've had access to, and also what you bring to the table, if that makes sense. Yeah, the first one that I think about in that regard is like Batman, who went from kind of campy, jokey, to serious, to really dark, to kind of like businessman. Mm -hmm. Like, and it just depends on how you interpret it at that time. Is that how that usually kind of works? Usually, yeah. It's the it's the generation, right, that you grew up in. It's like, how old were you? If you were 10 years old and you saw, like, Batman and Robin or Batman Forever, then, yeah, that's the version of Batman that, like, probably jives with you more. Um, but it's also worth noting that Batman, in his very first iteration, was dark and killed people. Um, not often, but it did happen from time to time. Um, and then, and I'm talking, like, in the less than a year old runs of Batman, right? Like circa 1939 kind of stuff. And then you introduce Robin and he softens a lot and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, so it depends on what era you grew up with. It's like, you know, Saturday Night Live. Yeah. <laughs> whatever whatever version you, grew up with, version you grew up with is the one you think is the best. So obviously, you know, superheroes are very popular. You can't, it seems like a new movie comes out every week or every month. But do they mean more to us now than they have in the past? It fluctuates. It, it comes and goes. Um, so, for example, okay, if we trace like the first superhero comic, not comic book, but the first superhero comic to Superman, right? So that's 1938, right? And he's wildly popular and wildly successful. And so is Batman. And so is Wonder Woman. And all those other like golden age heroes up until about the 1950s when we see the, a dramatic drop off because of anxieties surrounding them. Um, there's a reason that comic books were intensely popular during the depression and in the years afterwards, right? It was a way for people to escape a little bit and to really grapple onto something. But over time that changes in the fifties, you had a huge scare that they were um, part of the moral degradation of the youth in particular, because wonder woman was setting an example for how women should not be according to these sort of dominant social norms at the time. Um, uh, Goodness gracious, Bill Marston, his name escaped me for a minute. Bill Marston, who wrote Wonder Woman, wrote Wonder Woman to be socially and in particular sexually subversive at the time. And so when people were sort of reading, in, reading into that stuff, like the public pressure made the decline. And so from the 50s into the 60s, you see a, a precipitous drop in the number of titles that are being printed and the circulation, all that kind of stuff. And then they boom again, right, into like the 60s and what we call the Silver Age, which is where like Atlas Comics becomes Marvel Comics um, with the creation of Iron Man and Thor and all them. And they're hugely popular again, but they're popular among young people again, right? They, they've they always been for all audiences, but they post like the 60s, they tend to be more resonant with, with young folks. Um, and then they go up and they go down in the 90s. Like the reason that we have Spider-Man being made by Sony and... Uh, the X-Men being made by Fox and the MCU in its current iteration uh, starting back in 2008 was because Marvel sold off their properties because they were going under, right? They had to make money. So again, it comes and goes. 
was there ever a time that you would say that like, this was the peak? The peak of, not the peak of their popularity, but their peak of their influence in society. Oh, the peak of the influence was probably pre-1954 because the Comics Code Authority, which was a reaction to uh, congressional hearings um, that were concerned about the, uh, the negative influence of comics. So you had horror comics, you had you know, a lot of violence in comics, you had a lot of you know, sexuality and stuff that was transgressive in comics, in addition to the superhero comics, all this sort of stuff happening in the same like, time and in conversation with each other as these artists would bounce around from company to company and pick up freelance work and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, as early as like the 1940s, you had national newspapers calling comics uh, a disgrace to our society. Uh, and then in the 50s, you know, this sort of ramps up. It builds up over time. 1954, you have uh, Frederick Wortham's uh, Seduction of the Innocent, which is basically a very damning indictment of the comics industry. Admittedly, he was he was a I think he was a psychologist who was reading a lot into the comics and at the time overplaying their influence. But he was doing it all the same. And so he uh Seduction of the Innocent was kind of like the tipping point. And so you have these congressional hearings that lead to what's called the Comics Code Authority, right, which was invented in 1954. Um, the Comics Code Authority was the industry's way of self-regulating. So they said, look, you guys don't regulate us like federally and we'll regulate ourselves sort of in the same way that like the MPAA, right, the the Motion Picture uh Association, Alliance, association or whatever. Yeah, association, yeah. whatever the second A is. Uh, kind of like how they did with like the, the PG, the G, the rated R stuff, right? As a way of self-regulation. So comics did the same thing. And you saw a drop in like, there were some 650 plus comics uh, titles in, uh, in circulation in, um, or 650 publications in 1954. About 56, that drops to about 300. Man. Right? And the influence of the comics industry would never be the same up until maybe arguably, uh, you know, the early 2000s with the MCU and later the, the DC, you know, EU and stuff and things like that. Do you think it's dropped off or do you think that these people just aren't paying attention to the movies anymore as much as they did a couple of years ago? I think that the novelty has worn off, right? So depending on when you trace the beginnings of this, uh, a case can be made that the that the X-Men, uh, the, the Brian Singer X-Men movies in 2000 were the start of kind of where we are in our current landscape with, with superheroes. Although I would point out that I argue that, um, and, and I'm not alone in this, there's some others who argue that like Blade was kind of the proof of concept, right? In the 90s. Because I mean, how cool was that? That's right? a great movie. That's such an underrated movie. That looks like Blade was awesome. It legitimately was. And the other two weren't bad. Not as good, but at least in my opinion, but they weren't bad, right? Yeah, yeah. I would I would suggest that was like the proof of concept of superhero movies that got away from the Superman, Batman movies that we'd had for decades up until that point. But if you trace, even if you go to like to the early 2000s, right, as the start of our current wave of superhero uh, films, if this is like the Western genre, then we're halfway through because the Westerns lasted about 40 years in popularity, right? Um, and so we might be about halfway through and that means we're probably due for some waning, which I think is part of why Disney has said that they, um, they're going to s slow down the release of their, of their, uh, properties and stuff, because like, I think they're concerned about over inundating people, especially after like the, the conclusion of Endgame. I don't, we, you know, a lot of the things that I was going to, we were going to talk about kind of fit in some of our listener submitted questions. So are you ready for some harder slash listener submitted questions? Ready as I'm going to be. Most influential superhero of all time and influential, influential in the sense that like a broader impact on society. There's no one answer in my humble opinion. However, there are some top contenders, we'll say. OK, Superman 1938, we, you know, is the first like declared superhero bearing in mind we've been playing with those themes for a while but he's like the first super superhero prior to that you have like pulp heroes like doc savage or the phantom or uh you know john carter from mars right and he it's hard to overest to overstate his significance that being said i would also put in that similar category characters like wonder woman who was dealing with a lot of interesting things, again, sexually subversive at the time. The lasso was meant to be a combination of the truth detect of the lie detector, right? The lasso of truth was a lie detector test, which Bill Marston was involved in the creation of. 
was also a aspect of um, sexual bondage and the flipping of gender roles and dynamics, which Bill Marshall was a huge advocate for, right? Although he had some unfortunate, like biologically reductive perceptions on that all the same, that's the kind of idea that was there. So that was a huge thing. Uh, I would also put in Will Eisner's The Spirit because everyone, if you like reading comics, if you like people who create comics, it is almost without a shadow of a doubt, they have like read Will Eisner because he was so foundational and so influential. And The Spirit was a sort of uh, detective um, kind of story, sort of uh, sort of like proto Batman a little bit, uh, who who his, his public persona, his civilian identity died. And so he became the spirit as a vigilante and all that kind of stuff. And so we see a lot of those early tropes. He comes about in 1940. And then, you know, you have like your Captain Americas and folks like that who are continuing on these. So I would say in that early group, but also if you want a more modern answer, Spider-Man, it is hard mm -hmm. to overstate the value of Spider-Man. There's a reason his face is, has been on like the majority of Marvel comics since the sixties. It's because he's one of the best selling and therefore highly circulated and pop culturally known superheroes. He's the most like a real person, right? Like he was an average guy. Yeah. In many ways, Peter Parker couldn't catch a break. Right. And even more so because legacies are such a big deal in superhero narratives, right? Of who takes on the mantle next, all that kind of stuff. He has spawned some really successful mantles, some really successful legacies like Miles Morales, like Miguel O'Hara, like Jessica Drew, like it just, the list goes on. Is there one that you would say is like the most influential in a bad way in the sense that maybe they were co-opted by this group or that group and kind of became like a negative symbol? I'm starting to wonder if maybe your fans have been looking at my CV because I just had a uh, an article come out uh, that I co-authored with Dr. Lindsey Kramer uh, about uh, the Punisher and the Punisher logo. So they're like any any – any idiot can take an image and then repurpose it, right? And we see these sort of like reinterpretations of characters. It's not hard to find like, you know, white nationalist propaganda that uses, you know, maybe like Captain America or Hydra or something along those lines. But the Punisher phenomenon of the logo used by law enforcement and by people who are in support of law enforcement has since like, guys, like 2014, 2012, somewhere in there, has been unreal. Uh, and actually in our article that, that uh, Dr. Kramer and I published, um, I think it's called a uh, pleasurable marginality. I want to say um, it's in the Howard Journal of Communication, but we argue that like he legitimizes unintentionally, but he does legitimize a certain feeling felt among um, a particular demographic. That is to say, you know, working class white American males, uh, particularly younger men, but you know th that sort of demographic by validating their conspiratorial ideas, right? And he has often been this image of like, when the law fails, this is what you do. And he is a variation of the Western uh, cowboy trope, right? Of like, there is no law, but the man with the gun kind of thing. And so I find the Punisher stories really compelling. I enjoy them a lot. But also, I always like to tell folks like, it's okay to like Frank Castle if you understand Frank Castle doesn't like Frank Castle, right? There's a, there's a comic where Captain America just, you know, beat him black and blue. Uh, and he did not fight back because it was Captain America and also because on some level the Punisher knows like he has it coming, right? But that gets lost on the folks who have the thin blue line Punisher logo, right, in support of the police or who are police themselves, which is a real concern. Do publishers know this? Do publishers kind of know this and buy into it? Like, hey, we're really picking up some traction amongst angry teens. Oh, yeah. Let's, let's uh, go ahead and push this forward. Oh yeah, one of the co-creators of The Punisher, because The Punisher was meant to be an indictment of the legal system, right? That's the whole thing, right? His family is killed because of uh, the criminal element in New York City that is also working in, in conjunction with law enforcement. And The Punisher is therefore, as Archie Goodwin put it in an editorial note uh, bef uh, in the one of the early Punisher comics, he says, The Punisher is a problem that is worse, The Punisher is a solution that is worse than the problem that created him, right? That's the whole ethos behind the character. Uh, but Jerry Conway, uh, who co-created The Punisher back in the, in the uh, God, 70s, uh, 60s, 70s, said recently when he saw that there were people protesting against Black Lives Matter by wearing the Punisher logo and you know the whole Blue Lives uh, thing, said, like, you guys got it wrong. The Punisher doesn't support law enforcement. He's not that kind of guy. Y'all need to stop doing it. And actually, he did a fundraiser where he sold shirts 
in support of Black Lives Matter uh, of where the logos were people, artists putting their own spin on the Punisher logo to sort of reclaim that contested symbol. To what extent it's effective, I guess, is anyone's guess. We'll see what happens down the line. But at one point, you know, like there's a Punisher comic where and I'm talking like circa 2018, 2019, um, maybe in, in 2020, where Frank Castle confronts two uh, officers who have the Punisher logo like on their shirts. And he like he, he rips up the logo or no, he takes it off of a car is what it is. He takes a, a decal off the car and he rips it up and he says, look, if you want a role model, you look at Captain America. I do what I do. You don't do that. And if you do that, I'll put a bullet in you. Right. So, yeah, they absolutely know on some level these kind of discourses. What do you think about when they do it and also the public's reaction to it when this character who was a man is now a woman or this character who mm. was white is now Hispanic or black or something mm. like that? I'll get first to the public reaction because the why they do that is a little complicated. The public reaction of like, well, this is clearly some kind of agenda. My my more cynical response is, well, yeah, it all is like no, no one's writing these things just for the art. The artists are doing it, but also because it clears a check. Right. And this stuff is inherently persuasive, if for no other reason than to get you to buy more. So that is foundational to this industry. Right. Like it is any other mass media and, you know, art based industry. Um, <laughs> I love the MCU. We had three white guys named Chris lead it for a while. Right. Yeah. So. So when people say like, well, they're putting politics in, well, politics, politics have always been there. Uh, Cap, uh, Captain America debuted, like that was published issue number one, like six months before the attack on Pearl Harbor. And it's him punching Hitler, right? Jack Kirby on, on at least one occasion is, has been, was known to uh, try to throw down anyway with some Nazis while he was a civilian in the United States, right? Uh, they were about that life <laughs> and not even counting his, his time serving overseas. Um, so that's the thing is I think there's a lack of awareness, a lack of consciousness when it comes to like the political things that have always been integral to this. And then you hit a point where you're like, oh, there are politics here. Why are they putting politics in my comics? Nah, bro, it's been there from the beginning, right? The other thing is as to why they do that, why they, you know, change the, the gender or they change uh, the sex or they change the, the race or ethnicity or anything. Um, comics has a long and often unfortunate history with attempting to introduce characters uh, of color or characters that are not masculine, not men. Uh, and so the one that comes to mind is like Extraño, who was, I think a, it's either a Marvel or DC character, but Extraño was kind of like, think Dr. Strange, but from Latin America. And also it was the eighties. Uh, and he was gay and had HIV. <laughs> That's a lot. That's a lot. Like, right. Like, man, you went, you went the whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, the, the white tiger, uh, uh, superhero, uh, Hector Ayala was Puerto Rican and did one of the things that rarely happens in comics anymore. And that is he died permanently running from the police, right? He, he, he fled a trial where he thought he would, where it looked like he was going to lose and have to go to prison wrongly. He runs, he gets shot by the police and he's dead, dead. Right. Uh, and that's not a thing that typically happens. And they're trying to comment on what goes on with like law enforcement and, and people of color and in particular Latinos. And it's just like, they ended up breaking one of the cardinal rules at the same time. Right. So like there's this huge checkered past. I love Captain America comics, but like one of the early stories written by, I think it was like Jack Kirby and, uh, and, uh, no, it wasn't, it wasn't Stanley cause he wasn't around yet. But like, yeah, by, by Jack Kirby was that, um, it was a story basically of Captain America helping the good native Americans fight the bad native Americans where the bad ones were opposed to the American military. Right. Yeah. That's the kind of thing we're like, oh, shit, you can't do that now. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. Like yeah. you realize that the problems that are there, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. So there's always a thing of like people say, well, why don't you create your own comics? Well, people have been for forever. It's worth noting that most of the foundational uh, uh, heroes and superhero comics were created by Jewish folks, immigrants and people of color. Right. So like those. But what you can put actually on the page and what will sell usually looks like a Clark Kent right? Or Steve Rogers. So they were coming from these communities already. It's just that like they had to look a certain way in order to be marketable. And there's always been efforts to create new characters, uh, milestone comics, right? That gave us like static shock or icon, uh, or I think about like the, the different iterations of black lightning from DC, you know, going back to the seventies, like these were original characters, but there's always been Going back to the issue of like, they fluctuate in popularity, they fluctuate in terms of how successful these businesses are. Like 
they'll do well in like booming times, but when they hit a slump, those are comics that, you know, like get let go. So, so yeah, so they, they bend some stuff. They pass on like, oh geez, there was Jane Foster who was Thor, not Lady Thor. She was Thor right in the comics. And that we saw a little bit in the movies as well, or right now, Captain America is not Steve Rogers. It is Sam Wilson. And these are the natural progression of things. And it's frustrating because if it were, if Steve Rogers passed it on to another white dude, would people wouldn't think twice about it, but because there's a black character, it, you know, it becomes controversial among particular segments. I don't want to make it sound like all nerds have this opinion, but you know, it's that kind of thing. The one thing that I like, this is my question. Like, are there superheroes from other countries, right? Like, how come we never hear about Captain India or Captain Brazil, right? Or, or is this just dominated by America? It is an American art form. Uh, and so we've kind of cornered the market, but we're by no means. I mean, Britain has put out, uh, has put out comics, certainly. And, and actually two of the greatest uh, comics writers, um, Neil Gaiman and um, Alan, oh my gosh. Moore. Why is it? Alan Moore. I was thinking the one that looks like a wizard, that guy. Yeah. <laughs> Alan Moore, right. Uh, have, are, are, you know, Titans, uh, in the industry, even though they don't write that frequently anymore. Um, and or in case in um, worst case, hardly at all. So, yeah, I mean, there are characters from other, other parts of the world. Uh, India, I've seen some interesting comics from them, um, particularly dealing with like social issues, like sexual violence and stuff like that. Um, there's, Oh, there's some great, you know, Latin American comics. Um, so yeah, there's, you know, there's a lot of neat stuff happening, but it is an American art form that has been dominated by the United States and to some extent, Canada. Most controversial comic storyline of all time. I go back to the 1974 issue, like run of secret empire where Captain America watches Nixon shoot himself in the oval office. <laughs> like I have a hard time beating that. Um, although how they're certainly get, out there. Like, how does that get through? Right? Like, right. They never say it's Nixon. <laughs> Steve Rogers runs to the president's office, sees number one, right? In this secret uh, empire uh, hierarchy, encounters number one, and then he blows, like he, like you hear the bang as he reacts in horror to whoever this is killing himself. But who is going to be number one in this hierarchy and also in the Oval Office? It's obviously Nixon. Um, so I, I have a hard time getting past that, but I mean, you know, take your pick. Goodness gracious. There was a story where Carol Danvers, right. Um, Captain Marvel, uh, she was, she ran away to another dimension with an alien. This is like circa 1980s. I want to say she ran away to another dimension with an alien who like she fell in love with and then like has this child. And then you, you like, she comes back and you find out that she was brain controlled by this alien. Like he literally psychologically dominated her, convinced her to go to his home dimension where he impregnated her. And then she gives birth to basically an avatar of him so that he can be reborn with even better powers. And like, and, and that's, yeah, yeah. And then, and then, and then the other heroes are like, how could we have known? What do you mean? Like they kind of blame her a little bit for everything that happened. It's kind of nuts. Uh, so, the X-Men stuff, I mean, if you want to talk like controversial when they made Magneto into a Holocaust survivor, I would suggest that was controversial in a, in a positive way um, because he wasn't originally. He wasn't originally a Holocaust survivor. That wouldn't happen until the Chris Claremont run in the 19, 1980s, I believe. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of, of wild controversies that happen. It's just a matter of what you think. I, but again, I go back to Nixon shooting himself in the Oval Office. <laughs> Yeah, the president, yeah. Uh, the president taking himself out is going to be pretty high up there. On the, the sitting list, right? president at the time, <laughs> killing himself. Um, so one of the things that we kind of got asked was a couple of these kind of questions. If I give you like the name of a superhero, can you kind of give me like what their cultural significance is? I guess. Uh, sure. Yeah, I got you. Let's start with the easy one, right? Superman. Superman. Um, Jewish diaspora. Moses parallel. Uh, <laughs> Um, faked his death to uh, be thrown into a mass grave when Metropolis was invaded by not quite Nazis uh, kind of thing. I mean, he's always been a commentary on that sort of stuff. He was also a, uh, a critique of uh, city living. Uh, there was a lot of concerns in society about the agricultural versus the urban divide. And that if you go to cities, then you will be corrupted and you know live this life of vice and all that kind of stuff. And what could save them but a farm boy from Kansas, right? 
also his earliest superheroes, his earliest villains, excuse me, were like slum lords and uh, abusive husbands and um, you know violent youth, and so he was absolutely addressing like the the social anxieties at the time. Batman. Batman was a a gritty hero for a gritty environment. Again, going back to like the urban issue of like, you know, the sort of anxieties around what happens when you move to the city and there's more crime and all that kind of stuff. And Batman was that plus some degree of like redeeming value because he had um, because he had a the the boy ward. Right. Uh, uh, Dick Grayson. And could, so you had that sensitivity alongside this character who at least on one or two occasions murdered or accidentally killed a villain and just shrugged it off. It's like, man, it's a shame. And then kept on going. Right. So like you have that dichotomy existing there, not to mention, um, again, created by, uh, uh, by Jewish, uh, uh, comic creators. So there's some of that stuff tied in there too. Um, black Panther, black Panther, Afrofuturism invented by white guys. <laughs> like black Panther is a great example of how, uh, progress is a is a series of problematic steps forward, right? Because he absolutely was deeply entrenched in what we might refer to as the dark continent stereotypes and tropes, things like blackness being associated with a certain primitivity, because while he was a master scientist, T'Challa was also this sort of pseudo tribal savage in the way that he enacted his superhero uh, um, persona, right? With the Panther. Um, there's a lot of like coded racism in terms of like, uh, I think it was like, jungle adventures and things like that was or, or jungle comics being the title that he operated under for a long time he was also a trope of like being the most intelligent right he outsmarts the fantastic four in his initial debut um where he finds out like he's not actually a villain although he's kind of presented that way interestingly enough and this is a great example of how marvel has really sort of had a weird issue with civil rights black panther uh is i think published the year that the black panther party for self-defense declares itself and once they become popular a few months after the initial creation of Black Panther, uh, Marvel like cans Black Panther, uh, sidelines for a while. And for a little bit reintroduces him under the name of the Black Leopard in order to have some distance, right? And then later people are like, well, that's lame. And then so that only lasts like a few issues and then it, he reverts back to the Black Panther. So yeah, but because we get those early iterations that are rooted in like a lot of unfortunate stereotypes about blackness and African identity, uh, we get you know, the movies that we have now. Do the villains generally symbolize something or are they just villains? Oh yeah, no, they're always something. I mean, it, to the degree to which that we choose to interpret them that way, but also like I mentioned at the beginning, some of Superman's earliest villains were, you know, uh, corrupt business owners, right? Same thing with Captain America. The earliest Nazis that he was fighting were American Nazi sympathizers. Um, who were, there was one that was like a defense contractor, right? That was corrupt and working for the Third Reich, and that's who uh, Captain America, America fights. But going back to Superman, you know, yeah, he's fighting, you know, corrupt business owners. And then one who is his like defining villain, uh, Lex Luthor, who is a corrupt businessman, right? So, like those sort of things are, are absolutely there. There's an argument you can make that someone like Batman, his characters are um, different aspects of a particular persona. So, like the sexuality or the wealth. Uh, a Batman embodied in like Poison Ivy or the Penguin or his chaotic relationship with the law as being reflected in the Joker, things like that, that case can be made. Um, but yeah, they, they typically, a good villain, I think represents something. It's not just a throwaway. Um, Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman. So we have uh, feminist empowerment is as envisioned by a man at the time. If you notice, there's a lot of recurring themes of it's this group's empowerment, but uh, conceptualized by someone outside. Written of by group, someone right? who knows nothing Written about by, it. Right. Like, right. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, Bill Marston thought that women had uh, physiological organs that produced more love than men and that the salvation of society was going to be through women's empowerment. This is not true in a biological sense, but his idea of like, yeah, we need women to be empowered and so we can have a better society. Like that holds water, sure, yes. The physiological bit, maybe not so much. But like, it's important to note that in her early comics and consistently throughout her, her comics, like Wonder Woman has often tried to save her villains, right? She doesn't just throw them into uh, the dark pit of Arkham Asylum and then throw away the key. Like she's trying to use the lasso of truth to get them to confront themselves in many instances, right? So. Is there any other ones that you think like really jump out as kind of symbolizing something broader? Oh yeah, sure. Um, Luke Cage, 
uh, is a great one. So he's another character who has had a checkered history over time. He was initially created by Archie Goodwin and a couple others. Uh, Steve Englehart, who wrote Luke Cage early on, he didn't co-create him, but he was one of the early writers, said that um, basically Marvel, as he puts it, wanted some of that civil rights money. And so they charged a bunch of white guys to create a black superhero. And that's how you get Luke Cage, who was very stereotypical at the time. But, and interestingly enough, in his first issue, actively refuses to take part in a prison protest, right? Because like they're going on a, on a strike. Uh, the prisoners are going on like a hunger strike to like protest the cruel conditions. So they're touching on the, and this is like circa 1972, I want to say. So they're touching on like the terrible prison conditions at the time. And the fact that this disproportionately affects black men, but Luke Cage goes out of his way to say, no, I'm not taking part of this. I'm not getting any more days added onto my punishment. I'm not catching any heat for anybody else. Right. So he's not down with civil rights at the moment, right? Not in that capacity. Um, and so he's an interesting negotiation to becoming one of these like street level heroes who is community based, right? And whenever there's always this, this recurring conversation, I think Eric Kripke, the, the showrunner, has made this argument that superheroes are inherently like fascist. And I can see the appeal of a single savior, often a white male savior, who is going to like redeem society. But I would also point out the characters like Luke Cage, and there's a bunch of others that are street level uh, heroes, are also community advocates. Right, who are championing of uh, people who are left behind by a broken social contract, and so characters like that, or Black Lightning, or Miles Morales, uh, or Daredevil for that matter, like these characters speak to needs that are not being addressed. That's pretty much all the questions we got. Is there anything that you think we missed? What's kind of coming up next for you? I know you got a podcast as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, I have a I have a podcast, uh, Office Hours with Doctor C, where we talk about a bunch of stuff, um, you know, related to pop media, not just superheroes, but you know, other stuff as well. Uh, although, because of the ongoing strikes, we're trying to refrain from talking about like struck materials and things like that. But you know, we're still making uh, making stuff. But um, yeah, yeah. So I also you know do stuff on TikTok and Twitter and Instagram. Uh, you know, GA Cruz underscore PhD. Because not only am I in a tenure track job where I have to publish and teach a bunch, but I also need other things to do to keep my brain going, um, which is not at all true. That's a lie. I don't need more things, but <laughs> I can't stop. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So if anyone wants to, you know, find that kind of stuff, they can. Uh, and I'm always open to emails if anyone wants to, you know, ask questions. But my dissertation is online. It's bad writing, but it's a done thing. If no one knows what a dissertation is, it's basically a book you write so you can get a PhD and it's terrible, abysmal writing, but it like has some stuff about race, class and gender analysis and superheroes, which is my primary area of research. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, you just go to Ohio link and look for, you know, Gabriel Cruz dissertation superheroes and you'll find it. So yeah, anyway, I don't know. I'm trying to think of anything else that came to mind. The boys is good. I like the boys. <laughs> I do like the boys. I like Invincible too. I like Invincible, especially because of what they do with the violence. Because yeah, the it's violence, more realistic, right? It's very uncomfortable, and I like that they take this approach of like, "This is what you want. Let's turn it up to eleven and see how you feel about it." Kind of approach like that. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, most superhero media, uh, I. I try to consume or stay up to date on, although I am severely lacking in DC because even I have my limits. Um, what are they doing over there? I, I didn't watch black Adam until I had to sit six hours for a tattoo and it happened to be on. So <laughs> it's amazing how sometimes you can take like the same combination of things and sometimes it's a cake and sometimes it's a piece of shit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's the rock with superpowers, right? So, and which is most movies he's in on some level. So right. uh, it kind of is what it is. Yeah. So no, I'd, I think here's what I would say as just kind of a parting thought for anyone who's interested in superheroes and that kind of stuff. First of all, bear in mind, there are so many great comic books and graphic novels outside of superheroes. Superheroes are great, but they're not the sum total of everything. They're actually a very, like a, a reasonably small percentage of the overall uh, uh, industry. But also, like, it is okay to read into them. It is okay to critique them and it is okay to still like them at the same time, right? So you'll find problematic stuff in almost all of these things, but that doesn't mean you can't find enjoyment in it as well. You know, I liked Falcon and the Winter Soldier uh, and, you know, that miniseries, but it had some real problems when it came to critiques of the government and issues of race. But at the same time, I thought it did some neat stuff. So, you know, these things are, they're complex.
If you could have one superpower, what would it be? I mean, that's a tough one. I mean, flying would be great. Flying seems like it would be awesome. But I think that there's other powers that you could take, like, more advantage of. I mean, teleporting would probably be it. Because it would. how great would it be to go, listen, I want to go to Bangladesh. And you're right there. That would be awesome. But I don't know how that would work, right? Like, would you just look at it on a map? Or would you just have to do a series of teleports? Because otherwise, how would you know that you're not, like, teleporting into the middle of a building? <laughs> God, that would be, wouldn't that be terrible? Just, uh, I'm going to teleport to Miami Beach and you go to a building in downtown Detroit on the 13th floor or something. That would be the problem, right? I think a lot of superpowers sound like they would be cool in real life. But then if you think about it, I don't think a lot of them would work out. Like if you actually had super strength, I mean, you'd just be tearing your house apart because every time you went to open the door, you'd like rip it off <laughs> and none of your friends would have arms. <laughs> I mean... Hmm. I mean, super strength would be great, but uh, yeah, like you said, I don't know if it's practical, which right. neither is teleporting. However, really the most practical one, the best one would be able to read people's minds. Like mm -hmm. that would be the best one in a real life situation would be able to mind read because you could tell what people are really thinking and you could get like business secrets, all that kind of stuff. You could take a lot of advantage of that. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I the thing is, is I get what you're saying, but I don't I don't think I'd want to read people's minds. Or have the ability, because I, I don't really want to know what they're thinking. I don't know if you'd really want to know what people are really thinking either. <laughs> it's probably not the best, right? No, I actually think it's probably 96% negative. I think that would be really depressing, especially if, like, right? Like, if you could really know what people thought, mm -hmm. that would probably crush your self-confidence. I would go with reading people's minds, though, right? Like, maybe my self-confidence would be pretty low because you'd always find out the negative thoughts that people had of you, but you could also probably get pretty rich off of that pretty easily. I still think I would teleport. Teleportation sounds fantastic. Yeah, you could make a lot of money off of teleportation, too. Or, like, if I could like have a... instant... John's like, instant delivery service? Or, like, if I could have a, like, a, you know, like be the luckiest man on the face of the earth and win the lottery over and over. Like every time there's a large lottery, I just win it. That would be cool too. Like luck as a superpower. Yeah. That would sure. probably be the best superpower. Like luck. Yeah, that would be luck as a superpower would be the best. Yeah, it would be. I, but you know, once again, kind of like, uh, who was Spider-Man's uncle, uncle Ben's uncle, Jerry, uncle Ben, Regardless, uh, uh, with great responsibility comes great power. So great power comes great responsibility. One of those two. Well, Same thing, just different phrasing of it. I think it's with great power comes great responsibility. Un underrated movie. I'm going to put that out there into the podcast universe. I think the Which one? First uh, Spider-Man uh, of the um, Tobey Maguire series was, uh, was kind of underrated. I enjoyed it thoroughly. <sighs> The only one that's kind of really bad of the Spider-Mans, I think, would be Spider-Man 3. That would be the only one that was like, oh, that was kind of a bad movie. Everything else was pretty good, I honestly. Don't, I don't even remember which one that was. That with Doc Ock? No. Doc Ock was number two. Spider-Man 3 was with, like, 30 different ven villains. I think it had, like, Venom and the Sandman and the Green Goblin, or the Green Goblin's son, the Hobgoblin. There was just way too many people involved in that one. Hop but otherwise, Hopper. all Spider-Man movies have been pretty good. You know, I got to rant for one second. I'm sorry. I, okay. We I'm watched sure the, uh, me and the family watched the new uh, Little Mermaid movie, the live action version. Yeah. I don't know if I'm a fan of, of live action movies. And I'm not sure why. I just don't know if, like, either either make the movie or in terms of like have real actors and all that or go, you know, um, cartoon. I don't know why we have to be in the middle. I've never really understood. I am a big fan of animated movies and would generally almost always want to see the animated movie better, even with something that I'm a big fan of, like Star Wars. I think the Star Wars animated stuff is way cooler because you can do cooler stuff. But there is something interesting about live action. I don't understand. I've never watched any of those Disney movies that they've converted over and never even thought about it for a second. I mean, it's never even thought about it. It's not a, for, I, it's not a bad movie. So if you're, if you're on the fence to check it out, do it. It's just, I don't know. It's weird. And maybe because it's the first one I've seen, 
uh, maybe ever. I don't remember. Uh, it, it just, it just, I don't know. It's weird. I don't know how else to describe it. Wait a minute, but it's live action underwater. Are they actually underwater? They are, but they're not. No, they're not actually underwater. But oh. the, the movie takes place obviously under the sea. Hmm. Interesting. What did you have a superhero that you wanted to be growing up? You're like, I wish I was this superhero. I did not actually. I was I was raised with wrestling and sports, so I I, I didn't really have like the comic book heroes or uh, or someone in that that universe that I I wanted to be. Now, if you count wrestlers as superheroes, which I do not, you do not. Um, I don't think anyone does. I, th- I I think there's a small debate to be made there that I don't think that there's any debate to be made that a wrestler is a superhero. I don't think that there's any deb- okay, debate right. in any world ever in any universe I th- I think... amongst the multiverse that a wrestler is a superhero. I think there's a very small argument to be made I don't that think there's any argument whatsoever. All right, fine. So what's your su- what's your <laughs> argument then that a wrestler is a superhero? Well, the characters that they portray on on TV, uh, you know, especially in the cartoon era, the late '80s or uh, the mid '80s, late '80s, uh, you know, like Hulk Hogan. You could almost say that he was kind of like a superhero. No, not in any way. Say your prayers, eat your vitamins, kids. Go to bed early and you can be as strong as me. I mean, he was ultimate strength. Yeah, but that was ultimately a massive lie, right? The part they always leave out about that is eat your prayers. Or wait, no. Say your prayers, eat your vitamins, take massive amounts of steroids. <laughs> I mean, right? They're lying listen. to children. This is going to sound real ignorant, and I get that, but I feel like I have to say it, is that you can make a, a point that the serum that the Hulk uses could be steroids. We don't know. Yeah, but it's like gamma radiation, man. It's not <laughs> like just... they're not leaving that part out. Listen, I'm going. That's the thing that you don't realize as a kid is that all of like the heroes that you have in real life, it's all kind of bullshit, right? Like They're all fake heroes. Absolutely. Which is ironic. The real heroes in life are completely fake, right? I, I think I've said this story before, so I'm going to make it into a 30-second version. But I met Rudy, Rudy Rudiger. Like, I met the actual Rudy. And I was so excited. I was a junior in college or something. Uh, had admired him for all of his feats and being five foot four and making the Notre Dame football team. And I met him, and he was a complete asshole. Like, he was there just to make money. And then obviously, as you get older, you realize that most of those, like like you just said, most of those heroes um, are not actually heroes at all. No, not really. Anyway, uh, okay. All right. Are we ready for some shout outs, 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 outs? Yeah, sure. All right. Let's start with uh, a simple one here right off the bat. Uh, Jim Limber Rakis. Sure, I screwed that up royally. Jim Limber? <laughs> Rakus. Jim, Lam- Jim Lamber Rakus. Is it hyphenated? Is it hyphenated, or do you throw the middle name in there for no reason? No, I think that's his last name is Limber Rakus. But is it hyphenated? No. So it's just one long word that says Limber Rakus? It's like 42 letters? God, I hope we're not getting duped into saying something dumb. I don't think we are. Limber Rakus? I don't think so. <laughs> Limber Rakus. Even if so, good kudos for him. I, I usually say them out loud at least once, so I know that I'm not getting duped. Uh, Wait, so is there a space in his name, or is it all Limberacus? It's all it's all, it's all Limberacus. It's like seventy two letters. No, it's actually uh, ten, which is not that crazy. Oh, that's not that bad. Your last name has seven, so you're almost there. It's a pain in the ass to have a longer last name. If I write out my whole legal government name, it's a long thing. Let me see. And we're going to take a quick break. Just keep, you just keep going, and I'll tell you how many letters it is at the end of the <laughs> shout-outs. All right. Uh, moving on. Randolph Cologne Jr., Raphael Bischoff, Skylar Carter, Peter Wangechi, Jeff McCannish, James Minnie, Terrell Graves, Vince Liberto, Jose Vasquez, and Chris Fosh. Appreciate you. And you know what? Nick's still counting, so I'm going to say one more. Uh, Roxanne Miles. And how many letters? 22. 22 letters, man. And that's probably nothing to some people. 
How do you feel about people who have four names? I mean, it, I, 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 I strictly think it's a cultural thing. I mean, some in some cultures, people have like white people. Just okay, let's just go just straight to white, white people. people that's four. fair. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm, I, I don't know. I'm okay with it. I mean, I've never understood. The older I get, I've never understood. You know, like if you're a Christopher, and you go by Chris, why can't you just be a Chris? Why do you have to like put Christopher on your documents? Because that's your legal name. But like I'm my legal name is Nicholas. I have to put Nicholas on all legal documents because the government knows me as Nicholas. If you put Nick on there, it's spelled differently and people are going to think you're somebody else. Like generally, if you ask for your legal name, you got to write the whole thing, right? Yes. Like you're not going to put J. But what if I did? Well, then you'd be wrong. And then the IRS would be looking for you. They'd be like, who the hell is this person? They're not coming after me. No, they probably not. Well, well, ironically, the IRS comes after people who don't make very much money, so they probably are coming after you. <laughs> They're it. not coming after the people that are ripping them off. No. They're ripping us all off. They're, yeah, I generally feel that if you got four full four full names, man, there's gonna be there's about a ninety five percent chance we're gonna deal with some pretentiousness. <laughs> probably a ninety percent chance there's gonna be some douchebaggery. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. Uh, all right, well, if that's all you got, I'm uh, I'm bringing back. Fact or fiction. Oh, okay. The people were uh, something. I thought I saw a quick message about it wanting me to stump you again. So uh, profoundly pointless fact or fiction. Going to give Nick a couple of questions, see if he can get these uh, these right, whether they're true or false. Uh, we'll, start okay. off, we'll start off with a uh, an interesting one here. Kesha and Lucy Liu have claimed to have had sex with a ghost. True or false? I mean, sex with a ghost? <laughs> Lucy Liu doesn't seem like she would claim to have sex with a ghost. Wasn't she? Didn't she host like a Discovery Channel documentary kind of thing? Or did she have another sister that looked exactly like that? I don't, I'm going to say false, but only because of Lucy Liu. It is true, actually. So, according to her, Lucy Liu herself, she says, and once again, this is a quote, I need to keep saying that, some sort of spirit came down from God, who knows where from, and made love to me. I believe that's called a dream. <laughs> that It's a lot of cocaine is what that is. Could you imagine just telling somebody that? Right? Like, that's one of those things that I think celebrities just make this stuff up for attention, right? Like, Lucy Liu claims to have had sex yeah. with a ghost. Like, what's going to happen? What? How did Kesha have sex with a ghost? <laughs> well, there's also a quote by her, so I guess I'll read it. Um... She told Ryan Seacrest, of all people, on his radio show back when he had one. I mean, that's a that's a big audience. Mm, it's a big audience. Uh, that her song Supernatural was about her making love to a ghost. I lived in this flop house. I don't know what that is. At Rural Canyon, and there was some weird energy that lived there. It used to keep me up all night, wake me up, and it progressed into this dark sexual spirit. It scared me, but that's the fun part of it. Could you imagine just sitting there listening to that? <laughs> just being like, what do you say after somebody tells you that they have sex they had sex with a ghost? Like, well was it was it good? <laughs> like isn't the ghost a spirit? How did it become because if I've learned anything from the movie Ghost, it's that it's very difficult for ghosts to become corporal <laughs> and to be affect the physical world. Yeah, I'm actually I'm proud of you that you have seen the movie Ghost. Yeah, dude, everybody's... I don't know if I've actually, like, watched the whole movie, but I know some of the scenes, like... I thought I was going to say Oprah Winfrey, but there's Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> yeah, get, I mean, she was fantastic in that movie. I think we've talked about Patrick Swayze a little bit as well in the past. Not the biggest fan, um, but, you know, he... He was all right. I still get confused between Patrick Russell and Kurt Swayze. What's his name? Patrick Swayze and Kurt Russell. To me, Jesus. they're the same person. Jesus. Right? It's like that other guy. What is there? Jason Bateman and Paul Rudd. Same person. <laughs> Chris Evans and the other guy. I mean, they're always two celebrities that are exactly alike. I mean, they really are uh, like kind of interchangeable. I feel like most things in Hollywood, most people, aside from a couple, are, are interchangeable. Unless you're having sex with ghosts, man. That's the way to keep a career alive. <laughs> well, I mean, you were... 
you were wrong. Um, well, we all lost that. This should be an easy one for you. Elvis Presley, staying on the celebrity uh, side of things, was actually a natural blonde. Uh, yeah, I think that's true. It is true. According to uh, some archive that studied him, uh, he started using black shoe polish to darken his hair because he thought it made him more handsome. Could you imagine that using shoe polish to color your hair? Like that's a that's a crazy thing. I mean, it was back in like the 1950s, man. Did they even have like stuff like that? He that's probably what he had. I, I'm not hating on him. I'm I mean, good on him. Worked worked for him. Yeah, right. I worked mean, out for the guy. All right. So this was actually something that I because I was just doing a little research, believe it or not. I I'm surprised by this. So I'm curious to know if you think that this is true or false. Charlie Sheen accidentally accidentally shot his then fiance Kelly Preston. <laughs> oh, probably. I mean, yeah, that doesn't seem like something that you're gonna make up, and he doesn't exactly have a track record of good behavior. <laughs> that is true. He shot her in the arm when they were in the bathroom, and uh, uh, apparently he, uh, he they were in the bathroom doing something. He was taking off his pants. His revolver fell out of his 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 pants, fell on the ground, discharged a shot, and it went to her arm. Did she get hurt? I mean, she got hurt. Yeah, she, she was shot the in the arm. I mean, I've been shot in the arm, and I actually didn't get hurt. I mean, because I, I, I'm fucking made of steel. And the, we were really far away with the shotgun, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> I mean, all right. Well, um, this is another one that I didn't care to look at, but now I have to ask you. Uh, Harry Styles has four nipples. Well, pro- I mean, true or false? I don't. I don't. I don't even want to know. When it comes to any kind of celebrity news, like I don't even want to know. You have to say. <laughs> It's all about learning on this show and things that no one cares know if about. Terry Siles has four nipples or not. Well, it's true, and it's called polythelia, which is actually one of the most uncommon types of. They call it a body disorder. I don't know if that's what it is, but that you can have, and that's basically having four nipples instead of two. And four nipples seems like a lot of nipples. That's one too many. That's uh, right. Like if you got three nipples, that's like okay, that happens. Once you get to four <laughs> nipples, that's too many nipples. Like, uh, but they're not like full nipples. They're like little things or something like that, right? Did he have them? Are they still on his body? Or you have them removed? No, they're like under. They're kind of um, imagine like where the top of his rib cage is, where you can kind of start to see his like six pack indent. Now I need to look up Harry Styles four nipples. <laughs> See, oh, this is what regret this. you're not the only person right now, probably that's doing that. I don't want to see Harry Styles has four nipples. The same. Oh yeah, but not like really. I mean, you would think that they're just like a little pimple or something like that. Like I... it's not like. I mean, he's still walking around with his shirt off, so it's not like he's too worried about it. Yeah, I mean it's it's they're not terrible. Yeah, I think we would, like you wouldn't even notice that. Not really. I mean, you'd have to like be looking. Like, okay, that's a nipple. It looks more just like a sunspot. Right? It's not like he's got cow udders there or something like that. <laughs> I'm just I'm just saying I it's a fact. It's not like I'm making this up. Would you rather have four nipples or have sex with a ghost? Sex with a ghost. What if it was like a male ghost? <laughs> I mean, listen, no offense to any, no offense to any of our get... listeners that are into that thing, but then I would probably go with four nipples. Would that like would that count? If you were a straight man and you had sex with a male ghost, like there he just you know are you not I, I not did he did you get your does that count as not being a virgin anymore if you have sex with a ghost? Wow, we're really talking about this. I think there has to be physical insertion of a, of a body part into yours. And obviously, if you're a woman into woman, that can just be on the outside. But I feel like there has to be some kind of physical contact of some kind around your private areas. Well, there would have to be to have truly have sex with the ghost. I don't 
I I I don't I don't want to talk about this anymore. Like, what are you doing that you're just like I just fucked a ghost? What? I mean, well, I what? mean, <laughs> once again, it you can't prove it, right? So if anyone was to ever ask them in an interview, like that's not true, you can't prove it. So you're really just going off their yeah. Word. So all right, Which, I don't think most people are going to believe that. Um, are you ready for our top five? I have one more. Oh, okay. Boy, there's a lot today. Yeah, I well, I I wasn't gonna ask this one, but then I was like, you 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 talked about the celebrity thing, so I have an animal one for you. Oh, I like animal ones. And this is about uh, so fact or fiction. Uh, male koalas have a large two pronged penis, and a female koala has three vaginas and two uteruses. I'm gonna have to say that's true because that's too many things for you to just make up. <laughs> It is true, yes. Um, Yeah. Yeah, so obviously the female koala has all that for her pouch. And I'm not entirely sure yet. I didn't research why a male koala has a two-pronged penis. But sounds like it's effective. What does he mean, two-pronged? Like it goes, like, (laughs) out? Like make your, you know, make a V with your... Like a peace sign? Yeah, make a peace sign. And that's that's what a koala's penis, male penis is like. I'm not looking into this. Don't, please. And if you're Googling it out there, I apologize. Hopefully you're not doing it on a work computer. I don't like looking at gross things. Like, if I think something's going to be gross, I don't want to see it at all. Yeah, I, I, I had a, a coworker of mine actually was like, hey, do you want to see my neighbor, like, has some pretty... <laughs> he cut his hand with a uh, tree trimmer. No. Oh. But she had told me that it wasn't that bad. And when she showed me, I'm like... You know, we'll call her. We'll call her Laura just to, to make, give her a name. But I'm like Laura. His pinky finger is half severed, and she's like, "Yeah, but he's fine. They reattached it." I'm like, "Well, I'm never gonna just randomly look at something that you want to show me ever again." Never look at random pictures of things. If anybody's ever like, "I want to show you something," my answer is generally no. That's fair. Whatever it is, I don't want to see it. That's fair. I want to show you, and whatever it is, right? A YouTube video, an injury. An article. I don't look at things that people want to show me. That's an ap- that's a policy that I'm going to adopt from now on. I will no <laughs> longer look at anything that anyone wants to show me. A koala's penis, maybe. Don't want to see it. Harry Styles fourth nipples. Don't want to see it. <laughs> I don't even want to see Lucy Lou having sex with a ghost. If there was video of it, I'd be like, no, I don't want to watch that. <laughs> I mean, I didn't Google to see if there was video, but maybe. Do you think that would be at like the top of of uh, like one of the websites? Yes, like yeah, by far. You think that would be number one, Lucy Liu, with a ghost? I haven't done this, believe it or not, but I bet you if you go to the the most watched videos on those certain websites, I would I, I would say three out of five are probably some kind of celebrity induced something. Hmm. I've never been into that. Oh. Uh, I mean, I look at other stuff, but I'm just not looking at that. Okay, you ready for our top five? I am. Uh, so our top five is top five foods that come in a bowl. Top five foods in a let's say wait wait how should we I don't know if we should go from Lucy Lou ghost sex to coming in a bowl, <laughs> <laughs> but it's been done. It's been uh, done. Top five foods that are in a bowl. What's your number five? So this was. Did you have trouble with this list because there there are not at all. There are lots of options. Mm, there are, but there's not a lot of good ones. Well, there's a lot of good ones, but there's there's the dominant ones at the top, right? I thought about it for a while. There's a lot of foods that come in a bowl, but ultimately this was a pretty easy list for me. All right. Well, my number five, I'm going to put popcorn. You don't have to have pop. No. Nobody eats it out of the bag. <laughs> Nobody does. Well, I mean, I do. Of course you do. You're the one out yeah, of the bags right person. there person well i also like to engage in edibles in the weekend and i'm just gonna take the whole bag i'm not messing with this bowl give me the bag so uh, my list is foods that you eat out of a bowl not necessarily come in a bowl but foods that you eat out of a bowl and my number five is popcorn so yours would be like top five foods you eat in a bowl yes okay my number five is a burrito bowl Oh, oh I love a burrito bowl. Yeah. This is fantastic. I love mixing all kinds of stuff together. It's amazing. It's you still having the same burrito for dinner? 
Yeah, I have burritos for dinner about four times a week. Jesus Christ. Well, you know, protein, right? I switch it up, though. Sometimes I'll go chicken. Sometimes I'll go ground turkey. Ground, Sometimes yeah. I'll go, you know, like, well, yeah, no, actually, that's about it. Get it's that chicken ground turkey, turkey <laughs> shit out of here. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. what's, your, what's your cholesterol level? How many times you go to the doctor to get a checkup? They can't even read my cholesterol because they, they don't have a chart big enough. You got issues. What's your number four? <laughs> yes, to say the least. Uh, my number four is fruit. Eating fruit out of a bowl is is fantastic. I don't think that you understood this list. It's food you can eat out of a bowl. No, it's food that comes in a bowl. Like, just because you can put it in a bowl, like cheeseburger. Listen, do you Cheeseburger want, bowl. Do you, do you <laughs> Just want put a cheeseburger in the bowl and would, then I eat it out of it. Would you like to start <laughs> over? Because you have cereal... You sent me some examples, and you said cereal, and cereal doesn't you eat cereal come out of a bowl. But it doesn't come it. in a bowl. You put right, it in a everybody bowl. Ex- everybody no, accepts wrong. that you eat. Everybody accepts that you eat cereal out of a bowl. Nobody's eating it out of their hands. Right, but you can eat fruit by itself. Right, but people don't eat popcorn just out of the bag unless they're you. Right, but how often when we have these lists to go out, and then they come back with, "Wow, John's wrong on that." Listen. I have the text proof of you sending me two examples, and they are both things that go into a bowl. Yeah, but cereal and soup are different than fruit. Although I do actually eat fruit out of a bowl, but it's frozen fruit. So Listen, that doesn't count. Listen, I, I guess our lists are just going to have to be separate th- this week. Yeah, well, so one of them's going to be right, and one of them's going to be yours. <laughs> yeah, you're right. The right list. My number four is noodles. Any kind of noodles. Ramen noodles, pho, pho, poke bowl, acai bowl. Any kind of like noodle-based thing like that. Although acai isn't noodle-based. But you get it. Rice and noodle bowls. I mean, I have ramen and rice stir-fry bowls on my honorable mention. Okay, that works. (laughs) What's your number three? Sandwich? (laughs) Close. Sandwich bowl? Close. Salad. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Okay. You have salad at number three? I do, because I, I feel like there's a dominant two, like a top two. Okay, but when you have salad, like, are you just having lettuce and some dressing, or are you doing all kinds of crap? You know the answer What's all in, What's all in your salad? God. How many, do you have special salad tongs? How many <laughs> pairs of tongs you got now? I, I, I do have salad tongs. We've discussed this. I have. I know, just remind me how many pairs of tongs you have at your house. I mean, in total, I mean, I probably have a dozen. I mean, I, I have four <laughs> pairs of salad tongs that are the same brand of tong, but one's a little shorter, one's a little bigger. They're all separate colors. It's awesome. Do they have their own drawer then? The tong drawer? No, I mean, they're in a they're in like a little container with other utensils like spatulas and things. How many kind of spatulas do you have? I don't know, eight, ten. Are you fucking serious? I you mean, got eight. How long you been? In a, how long you been an adult for? I've been. I mean, since I was, I guess, however you want to define that. I've been living on my own since I was eighteen. I mean, I and I'll tell you what. I've got one spatula because it does the whole job, right? It's I mean, not. I, like, I, oh no, get the big one. I mean, I, I I have big spatulas, little spatulas, non-stick spatulas, old spatulas. I don't think, listen, if anyone out there wants to comment on any of our social media or send a direct message, maybe maybe I'm in the wrong. Maybe it's abnormal to have multiple kitchen utensils. You don't have multiple kitchen utensils, right? Like if you had two spatulas, like, no, way, this is the one that I use on the nonstick pan so I don't mess up the Teflon or whatever. But if you've got eight spatulas, you've crossed the line. I, I, can, I can approve no more than three. If you had three, it'd be like, okay, well, all right, maybe. I mean, I, I don't disagree with you. However, I disagree with you, if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, man. I would just be like, if my wife came home with another spatula and we had eight spatulas, that, I'll tell you where that spatula's going. Right out the fucking door. No, it's me not. throwing it's not. it. No, but you're putting it in. in I've your... actually, that is the only time, that is the only thing that I've ever been like upset enough to throw was a spatula. 
Like I, mean, I threw it out into the bushes and then I went and got it because I'm not getting rid of a spatula. I guess I go buy another one. See what I'm saying? See, they're well. I'll, I'll tell you what. You do that again. I'll, I'll I'll FedEx one over to you. You got plenty of them. What was your number three, by the way? Salad. All about. Okay, but what do you put in your salad? Like, how much stuff do you put in there? So usually, um, salad base with uh, goat cheese, cran cranberries, croutons. Um, and then some kind of usually, um, like vinaigrette sauce. It's good. I probably have that four to four to five days a week. Like sometimes that's my dinner and I'll just throw a chicken breast in there or some ground Turkey. Okay. No, I won't grow. Okay. I will not eat ground Turkey, but chicken breast for sure. Yeah. You wouldn't want ground Turkey in a salad. That wouldn't be good. Right? Like you got to have some substance in there. Maybe some bacon okay. bits. Um, I generally don't approve of anything more than a few things in my salad. I'll have salad, salad dressing, maybe some croutons or a bacon bit like thing. But if you start getting all kinds of crap in there, that's too much for me. So like I don't want to deal with all that. If you're a fancy, if you're a fancy cheese guy, a good gorgonzola, a blue cheese, oh man, goat you're cheese. Such, you really are such a snob. That's fine. About... <laughs> What's your number three? Chili. I, I left that off the list, but uh, that's that's it's, that could be a, a, a number six for me. Like it's it should be there. How do you put chili behind fruit? This is why I get so upset about your list because you can't possibly say I love fruit, but it's not like a bowl based food. Because I mean, I don't really, I don't have a reason. I don't. I mean. I just I, I don't have a reason. Chili could okay. e- chili and fruit could easily be interchangeable, but I went with fruit because I went with fruit. Okay. Well, my number 3 is chili, which is clearly the right answer. What's your number 2? Cereal. Yeah, cereal is my number 2 as well. Uh, do we have the same Cereal's number 2 favorite. and number 1? I doubt it because my number 1 is I think the greatest thing that to be in a bowl that you could possibly imagine. All right, well, I'll get my number 1 out of the way and that's soup. My number one is a bread bowl. I have a love-hate relationship with bread bowls. Um, understand them, don't really need to have them. I think that literally everything is better in a bread bowl. Chili bread bowl, soup bread bowl. I think bread bowl is the greatest thing in the world. I think it's the greatest thing in the world. It's creamy and bread. You can dip the bread right in there. It's it's fantastic. There's a hole it's that fantastic. you can probably stick your head in. You can save the bread. The only thing a pro- problem with the bread bowl is you can't really save the bread bowl. It's not a good like to go thing. No, not really. You cannot save you the bread bowl. It. What's your honorable mention? So I got uh, trail mix dips. Ooh, uh, good. You see, this is why I'm upset. You're gonna put fruit above dip. Like you're gonna put fruit above nacho dip, ranch dip. Seven-layer dip. I'll make you a deal. You dip, I dip. We dip? Yeah. When I dip, I dip. You dip. Uh, let's see. We talked about ramen. We talked about rice. I have chili on there, and uh, I'll end with salsa. Okay. Those are all respectable. I actually think your honorable mention list is better than your actual list. <laughs> I, I don't agree with you, but what's on your honorable mention? The only thing that I had on my honorable mention was salad. But I'm not going to go ahead and elevate salad up ahead of that. The thing is, is that I would have had a lot of stuff in my honorable mention, but I think that they all kind of fell under that noodles rice category that I had at number four, like ramen. and Is it pho or pho? Pho, I believe. I think it's pho. It's spelled P-H-O. I know that. Do you prefer That's all I have in my honorable mention. Wet noodle or a dry noodle? Mm, I don't know the difference. You usually don't. 